Hi, everyone. Um, we're just going to wait a few more minutes um, to let some more people uh, come join us. But thank you so much for joining the webinar. Um, we'll be starting really soon. Um, Heidi, Todd, um, do you have any stories from recent bike rides just to fill the time? <laughs> Well, I certainly have been getting a lot of use out of my e-bike during the lockdown here, and we live at the top of a very tall hill. <laughs> so I use my e-bike frequently to go to the uh, go and get groceries or go to the pharmacy or things like that. And it's been a great alternative to taking the car. And every time I get out on my e-bike and uh, go somewhere, you know, I remind myself that that's one less uh, one less uh, trip with my car. And so it's been fantastic, great thing to have. That's awesome. I'm trying to think. I just took up mountain biking. I say that very liberally because I feel like at this point it's more like taking my bike for a walk rather than actually mountain biking. There's a lot of walking the bike that happens. But I tried with just like a traditional mountain bike and then I went out with an e-mountain bike and I felt like my, I just had superpowers. Like the first time I was walking my bike every day and then I had this e-mountain bike. I was like, I am like a world-class rider right now with my e-mountain bike. Like having that assist to get up the hills just made things so much easier. Yeah, that sounds like a great idea. Going back to the traditional mountain bike, it's a hard sell. <laughs> <laughs> that must be tough being in sales then. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and oh, that's God. a great point because I think e-bikes really are for everybody. Mm. And they're uh, certainly not going to take over, you know, 100%. Uh, but I think even, you know, people of all ages, I think are going to find them very, uh, very fun to ride. And I think that's one of the great things about them. Oh, totally. Like, I'm a very fit person. And most people think that e-bikes are just for people that maybe aren't so fit or don't ride so much. But the thing I found, especially with the e-mountain bike, was just that for learning on mountain biking, a lot of it is something gets too tricky and you have to stop. But then you have to walk your bike away before you can start again because you're on a slope or something like that. But when you had the e-assist, you could start from anywhere. And actually having that assist to the pedals meant that I didn't have to think about getting my cadence up. I could just focus on the line I was taking and that sort of thing. So it was so helpful just in terms of skills, not even the fitness part. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Absolutely. And I live at the top of a 500-foot uh, hill. <laughs> so it's always uh, a, little, a little bit of a... A little bit of a disincentive to ride up there with a couple of panniers full of groceries. For and, sure. Uh, since I got the e-bike, uh, I can I can make it up there with anything without breaking a sweat. So it's just been fantastic, and my car has gotten a lot less use. So that's been great. That's awesome. I think that's actually a great transition. We have about 16 people here so far, so I think that's a good a good place to start with. Um, so hello everybody, thank you for joining us. Um, my name is Justine, I'm the Bike Skills Coordinator uh, here at Bike to Work Society, and today I'll be the moderator for our webinar on uh, e-bikes. And I'm so pleased to introduce our speakers today. We have Todd, uh, he is one of our Bike Skills instructors, and we also have Heidi Ulrich, and she's from Oak Bay Bikes. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, before we get started, I just wanted folks to know that the presentation will last about 30 minutes and then we'll have lots of time for questions. And to add your questions, um, on the right, right side of your screen, there should be a uh, control panel. And in there, there's a questions box. Type your questions in there. Um, I'll be looking at them during the presentation, writing them down, making sure that we get to all of them at the end. Um, so after the presentation, Todd and Heidi are going to answer all these questions. Um, after the webinar itself, we're going to ask folks to fill out a short survey on their experiences, um, and it should appear on your screen after the webinar finishes. Um, anyone who's attended a webinar before knows that probably there will be technical difficulties. <laughs> um, but don't worry, this whole webinar is being recorded and it'll be available for free. Um, on our website uh, early next week. Um, and that will also be included, uh, the, the link will be included in a follow-up email as well. 
Um, so for those just joining us, welcome again. This is the e-bike revolution webinar. And without further ado, I will turn the controls over to Todd and Heidi. Hey, well, thank you very much. And thanks to everyone for making time today. And uh, special thanks to Heidi for joining us. Uh, Heidi's with uh, Oak Bay Bikes. We're one of the uh, pioneering uh, bike shops in Victoria uh, in terms of bringing uh, electric bikes to the market. So uh, glad she can uh, make it today. So uh, what I'm gonna do is ask uh, Heidi a number of questions here and just try to get some perspectives on uh, the different aspects of e-bikes. Uh, the first one here, uh, and again, I have a few points below, uh, is sort of based on ICBC's definition of what an e-bike is, and this is probably a good starting point. And so, Heidi, what is an e-bike? Um, yeah, an e-bike is your standard pedal bike uh, that has a motor on it, so some electric assist. Um, it's capped in Canada at 32 kilometers an hour. Um, they function very much as a traditional bike, but they've got that, that electric capability with them, so just some assist with that. Well, that's excellent. And there's a few uh, few points in the uh, ICBC regulation. So it's got to have pedals. <laughs> <laughs> the pedals have to work. Uh, now, there's a few good things about it. It doesn't require registration, a driver's license, or insurance. So that's one of the things. It's a bit of an advantage over uh, traditional motorcycles or cars. Uh, it does not require a driver's license, but you should be 16 years old to, or the law says you should be 16 years old to ride one. Uh, just like any other bicycle, you've got to have a helmet, and I'll come back to that later. But it, you know, it seems it seems so logical, but uh, people I see still riding around without a helmet. Yeah. Uh, so the bike again has assistance up to 32 kilometers an hour. You can go faster than that, but it all all comes to you <laughs> beyond yeah, that speed. Yeah, it just cuts out, and that's just manpower then. Absolutely, and. Uh, uh, you can ride them on any road or trail in the uh, capital region here, including the regional trails like the uh, Lockside Trail and the Galloping Goose. And the things that are not e-bikes, uh, anything that's gasoline powered. So I know we see things that look like a bicycle but have gas engines. Those are absolutely not uh, allowed on uh, trails and so on. Or sometimes you'll see uh, e-bikes that look like a motorcycle but do not have or a little scooter but do not have functioning pedals. And uh, so there's been some court cases around those recently. Those are not e-bikes, and I would sure encourage people to uh, stay away from those for the time being. So, okay, next, uh, let me just move to my next slide here. Uh, so different kinds of e-bikes. So uh, Heidi, what are the different kinds of e-bikes? Yeah, so uh, there's three kind of main e-bikes, which I see you've got in the corner there. Um, there's the front hub where you're going to find the motor in the front wheel. There's the rear hub where the motor is going to be in the back wheel. And then there's the mid-drive motors where the, the weight, the motor, is centered in the, in the frame of the bike in the bottom bracket there. There's advantages to each um, with the rear hub motors. And sometimes with the front ones as well, you have the option of a throttle which is awesome where you can just push a button you don't need to pedal um, with the mid drive ones I really like it because the weight is centered in the frame of the bike so you're not feeling like on a wet or rainy day because all the weight is centered in the rear or the front of the, the wheels your wheels are going to skid at all it's really just um, a very centered balance that's great thanks and uh, what, what's the most popular kind these days um we're seeing the mid-drive be the most popular. It doesn't have that throttle option, but it does, we find, have the greatest assist for the pedals, especially just like the functionality of it. So when, if you get a flat tire, you have traditional wheels, so it's a little bit easier to take them on and off to, to change a flat. Um, again, the weight centered in the frame of the bike. If you want to put cargo and that sort of things on the back, you're not having a crazy amount of weight on the back of your bike because you've already got that motor there. Um, so things like cargo bikes or child carriers or that sort of thing, we're just seeing the mid-drive ones be the most popular. Well, that's awesome. Well, thanks. And then on the right-hand side, I have pictures of some of the multitude of <laughs> different bicycles <laughs> that do come with uh, e-assist these days. And I think basically everything can be get, uh, purchased with an e-assist. And uh, in the orange is a sort of a typical hybrid or commuter bike. Yeah. Uh, in the gray is a folding bike, so those are fairly common now. Uh, the black one is a an e road bike, which uh, really has just come into uh, uh, into the market in the last couple of years. 
the white bike is a cargo bike and we'll come back and talk about that a little bit more and then uh, the one at the bottom is an e-mountain bike so and there's a multitude of <laughs> other bicycle types that do come with e-assist and it's probably uh, what would you say Heidi is it one of the hottest things in the market these days yes yeah absolutely super uh, now the next question is why are people uh, you know why are, um, are people buying e-bikes and again I have a little bit of a survey there but Heidi you sure appreciate your perspective on this yeah God honestly everyone is buying e-bikes um, the the parent that wants to drop their kids off at school and that sort of thing or replace their car with it they're getting e-bikes just because if you've got two or three kids on the back of the bike as you know that weighs down the bike and makes the hill quite a bit harder so parents are getting them um commuters are getting them to replace their car people that would usually be in that call would crawl that sort of thing are getting the e-bikes so that they're able to get to work maybe even faster than they would in their car um people that are kind of getting older but still really want to do their longer rides or their more difficult mountain bike rides they're getting e-bikes to still stay fit and then just the recreational rider that wants to wants to go out for a longer ride or carry some heavier equipment that sort of thing well that's awesome and as you can see from the uh, graphic on the right here there's a whole multitude of reasons why people are getting e-bikes uh, there's also part of the survey that looked at the demographics or the ages of people that are mm -hmm. getting e-bikes and I think it'd be fair to say that there's really people of all ages and not just, uh, you know, not just older folks that are riding e-bikes really? and uh, they have a lot of utility and I'd have to say owning one, they're a lot of fun as well. So <laughs> uh, just to comment on the commuting side, uh, the traditional wisdom is that people will commute up to about 10 kilometers uh, on a, a sort of traditional unassisted yeah. bike. And I think what people are finding is when people are using e-bikes, uh, that they'll commute up to 20 kilometers so it sort of really multiplies the number of people that uh, do have a, a feasible commute and of course because it is assisted uh, you end up getting to your destination you know without getting all sweaty and all that stuff and it makes it a lot easier for people just to you know hop off the bike and uh, you know yeah. just to head into the office. Yeah, I think you touched on a really good point there that uh, even just the willingness to commute as some people they want to commute in their nice office clothes. They don't want to have to shower and change at the office or having to add that extra time on whether it be 10, 15 minutes in the morning to commute on the bike. They no longer have to do that. So biking to work becomes a more feasible option for them. For sure, thanks. Now, how much is an e-bike cost, Heidi? <laughs> yeah, so I, I love the chart down there. That's really accurate for uh, your quality e-bike. Um, you are looking, about $2,300 all the way up, depending on what kind of parts and components, what kind of assist level you want on the bike. Um, for the cargo e-bikes, the ones to carry kids and that sort of thing, um, that $3,000 price point. And then in the more specialty ones for the high performance road bike or the full suspension mountain bike, definitely a little more there looking at kind of the $4,000, $5,000 price point, but you can get into an e-bike for $1,000. Well, that's right. And yeah, there's certainly a, a whole multitude of uh, ranges of uh, uh, bikes and costs. And, you know, again, I guess a lot of it really depends on what your expectations are, how often you're going to use it and, uh, you know, kind of how long you're planning to have it. But, yeah. but uh, prices have come down a bit. It's a, um, a bit of an investment compared to a traditional unassisted bike. Uh, but I think you can look at some of these costs in relation to a, a car <laughs> mm -hmm. and a basic car these days can cost $20,000 very e uh, easily, you know, plus you've got to pay one or $2,000 a year in insurance. And I think the traditional uh, wisdom these days is you pay about 30 cents a kilometer in terms of operating costs. Yeah. So when you kind of add all those things up over six months or a year, I think many people are finding that an e-bike is a, uh, a very good way to uh, save money compared to a yeah. car as well. A lot of people come in that have crunched those numbers and decided that the amount they pay in the insurance and gas costs, they'll be able to recoup in the cost of an e-bike in a matter of a year kind of thing. And the other thing too, which I did just look into is BC still has their scrap it program going on where you can trade in your bike and you'll get a credit towards um, an electric assist bike, which is a really great option if you're looking to switch your commuting from a car to a bike. Well, that's excellent. 
Now, uh, then the next question is, given that most people have never ridden an e-bike, <laughs> Heidi, how would you go about buying one? <laughs> yeah, honestly, getting on and trying it is the most important thing for e-bikes. And like we said, there's so many different kinds of e-bikes. It's really a personal choice. There's upright riding positions, there's your more tr traditional riding positions, and then you, there's your aero road bikes. So really getting on and trying it is the most important part. And the assist really speaks to yourself. It's just so much fun to ride those bikes. So there's a bunch of different options. For us at Oak Bay Bikes, one of our favorite things is our demo on demand, where we'll bring the bike to you, we'll drop it off. You can ride it where you live, so you can uh, see how it functions on what you would be riding. We'll give it to you for a couple days, pick it up when you're done with it, and there's no charge for that because we really do want you to experience what an e-bike is like. Um, but you can also do test rides around the shop. Um, once you purchase an e-bike, like they're just, I mean, they speak for themselves. They're fantastic. Um, we uh, we do um, like all of the, the kind of technology and teaching about the e-bike and how your e-bike works, but I know Bike to Work Week, you guys as well do your bike safety courses and teaching you um, the safety on the roads, especially specific to e-bike, which is really important. Well, excellent. And let's say somebody wanted to get an e-bike. How is the supply these days? Yeah, um, actually, it's really good right now. We just had a whole boatload of them come in the other day, which is really exciting. They're a little heavy to get down the stairs, <laughs> but they're so much fun. Um, so once you decide to purchase um, the bike, if it's a bike we have in store, we can usually get you rolling in about 48 hours, if not right on the spot, which is cool. Well, that's great. Yeah, as soon as people get excited about it, they, uh, they definitely want to uh, get yeah. started. And I'd have to say myself that, you know, I wasn't much of a believer in the e-bike concept until I actually tried one. <laughs> and I really did find it to be a very enjoyable thing to uh, ride. Uh, the demo thing is really great. I live at the top of the Dean Park Hill, which is 450 feet above <laughs> sea level. And yeah. uh, so making sure that the e-bike would actually get up there and that I could have, you know, 20 kilos of groceries and still make it up the hill uh, was an important thing for me to confirm. So those demos are really excellent. And uh, support and maintenance certainly encourage people to buy through local bike shops such as Oak Bay Bikes. And uh, uh, one can, if th one thinks about it this way, it's kind of a combination of a bike <laughs> in the traditional sense of one that's unassisted. Plus most of them do have a, a significant com computer component as well. And so uh, mm -hmm. to try to get proper support from that, encourage people to deal with bike shops uh, rather yeah. than uh, mass market retailers. Yeah, one of the important things to remember with your e-bike is it's also similar to a computer where it will need um, the occasional update and bug fix and that sort of thing. So making sure you're taking it to a proper retailer where it can plug it in and update your whole system and get rid of any bug fixes, that's a really important part of it. Awesome. Now, one of the other things that you touched on earlier, Heidi, was just around uh, using uh, e-assist bikes for cargo and to uh, transport kids. I got one statistic here that was a real eye-opener for me. In uh, BC, 27% of all vehicle trips are taking children to or from school. Uh, so can you maybe talk to how people are using these things for cargo and for transporting their families? Yeah. Um, I mean, the options honestly are endless with this one. Like, I love that um, restaurants around Victoria have contacted us and they've started doing their deliveries via e-bike, which is super cool. Um, one of the biggest ones, as you touched on, is parents bringing their kids to school via e-bikes. And there's so many options for putting kids on e-bikes that really, um, if you're a little bit nervous about it, there's so many different options that you can be comfortable. Um, so whether it's like some of the pictures having that big basket on the front that you stick your kids in, that's an option, or having a longer kind of rail off the back that you're putting your kids into, that's an option as well. And the e-assist really just makes it more feasible to have all that weight on the bike and still be able to make it to and from school in a timely manner. Um, we at the bike shop have turned a cargo, cargo bike into our bike delivery thing. So we actually put bikes on the front of a cargo bike and deliver them. So really you can make an e-bike work for whatever your needs are. Well, that's awesome. And cargo bikes have been around as a concept for quite a while, but unless you were like a former Olympic athlete or something, <laughs> trying to take two or three kids yeah. somewhere in a cargo bike was definitely a big, uh, a big challenge. 
Uh, the photo in the middle is actually from a movie called Motherload. And the uh, Greater Victoria Cycling Coalition uh, sponsored a screening of Motherload a little bit, um, I think, uh, last year at the uh, university. And uh, what it did is it told the stories of uh, uh, mothers that were starting to use cargo bikes to take their kids to and from school and all of the uh, benefits uh, to their families and to the uh, moms themselves in terms of having a, uh, a great and very feasible way to get fit and stay fit. So uh, strongly encouraged and uh, people can uh, transport anything up to <laughs> uh, several hundred pounds on an e-bike. So that's not an uncommon thing at all. I think and, Important things to note, like you said about this staying fit, is with the electric bikes, there's this, this notion that you can't get a workout with your e-bike, and that is not the case. Like if you wanted to turn that assist off and push 200 pounds of kids in it, you're more than welcome to and you can get a workout. And even having that assist on, you can either ride it as a regular bike or you can use lower levels of assist. And I find even for me when I get on an e-bike, it's still a great workout. Absolutely. You can do as much or as little work as you want. And I'll uh, uh, frequently turn my motor off if I'm looking for a workout. And uh, yeah, it's a fantastic option. Absolutely. Now, uh, e-bike range and charging. So uh, can you talk to us a little bit, Heidi, about the things that affect range and what people might realistically see? Totally. So like we touched on earlier with kind of the price points, um, the price points kind of dictate like the different ranges that you're going to get. So you, for your base model e-bike, for your budget e-bike we had in the first slide, um, you're going to get the lower levels of ranges, so around 40 kilometers for kind of your um, more quality e-bike, as we were saying. Um, you can get ranges more than 100 kilometers on just one single charge. So you can, if you are looking to do those longer rides on a single charge, it's totally feasible with an e-bike and the charging is actually really quick you for most e-bikes can take the battery off the bike which is nice so you can bring it into your house to charge it um, and usually it takes um for the for the bigger batteries um about two hours to get it from zero to 60 percent and then another two two and a half hours to get a full charge for those smaller batteries that the range is a little bit less you can charge them in two hours which is really nice yeah, that's just awesome. And again, uh, you know, the uh, depending on the type of bike, some of them even come with two batteries. Mm -hmm. uh, the distance and the terrain, of course, can affect the amount of uh, range that you do have. And uh, the level of assist is adjustable on all these bikes. You can have it anywhere from, you know, very high assist to go up hills, uh, anywhere to lower off, just depending on the kind of terrain that you um, are on and how much of a workout you want to have. Uh, the range of the bikes is generally sufficient that if people are using them for commuting or to go get groceries or that sort of thing, they normally have more than enough range to go there and back uh, without being charged. Uh, if you do have longer commutes and things, sometimes people will have a second charger at work that they'll use to uh, I get things charged back up, but I would say that's not very common. And then the other thing to consider is that the chargers themselves actually don't weigh very much. So if people are looking for a bit of an insurance policy when they're going out for a ride, uh, sometimes they'll just throw the charger in their bag and should they happen to run out, they'll uh, you know go to a coffee shop, uh, plug in for a half an hour and then that gives them more than enough juice to get home. All right, so on to the uh, next one, security. So as one might imagine, if you're buying a bike that costs anywhere between $2,000 and $5,000, it's quite a tempting thing for uh, bike thieves. And uh, so just wanted to talk a little bit about security. Mm. So uh, Heidi, what kind of advice do you provide to your uh, e-bike buyers? Yeah, biggest one, don't use a cable lock to lock up your bike. Those are just not good enough. As you said, the, the e-bikes are a higher price point. So obviously a higher target for that thieves. Um, using something that is stronger. So a cable lock, um, a chain lock that's reinforced steel. Um, a uh, a rigid just something that's rigid that can't just be cut through is really really important the other thing too to note is if you've got one of the the wheel motors making sure you're locking your wheel as well as your frame <laughs> whatever you're locking it to so the thief isn't just going to come take your wheel with the motor and and walk off with that is really important and then 
registering it with your your police whatever area you're in making sure you're registering it with the police um, and project 529 and then a lot of the lock companies actually provide insurance along with your lock purchase so that's another really important thing to take advantage of as well yeah, super. And uh, insuring your bike, uh, a lot of people go through either their homeowner's insurance or sometimes they'll buy a standalone insurance as well. Yeah. Uh, and as far as locks go with an e-bike, weight is not as much of an issue as it is with a conventional bike. So you can buy a pretty heavy duty lock. Yeah. Uh, these photos are actually of my bike. <laughs> so I have a, quite, a, quite a robust uh, Abus U-lock there that I use with my bike and it uh, fits into a little bracket on the frame. So it's always with me. Yeah. Uh, what I'm showing in the top two photos are locking um, uh, locking skewers and bolts yeah. for the wheels and for, in this case, the stem. And uh, it's a good option as well so that when you lock your bike up, you don't need to lock the wheels or, you know, try to lock the seat and things, uh, but that they have uh, uh, fasteners that uh, basically people are unable to uh, unable to undo. So it definitely makes it easier. And uh, otherwise, it's a good idea to secure your wheels, seat, battery, and the uh, handlebars. And uh, most of the batteries do lock onto the bike, so they do have a key or something that's required yeah. to remove it. But uh, removing the uh, battery can be a bit of a painful thing, and so it's something that uh, you know something that people need to kind of think their way through. Uh, the other comment that's worth making is even if you do have your bike in a secure location, such as a bike cage. If it's shared with other people, you still need to lock it because there have been a number of cases recently uh, where people have uh, stolen bikes out of uh, shared bike cages. And so that's another thing that uh, people should be mindful of. And in the top right photo, I've got the little decal from the Vic PD. Yeah. So if you go and register your bike with the Vic PD, which they will do at no cost, uh, they provide you with uh, decals to go on your bike to uh, show that it's been registered. And uh, you can also get the same thing with Project 529. So, mm -hmm. okay, skills. So, um, maybe just to kind of make a few uh, initial comments in here. So, it really is the same principles as any other bike, and uh, you have to obey the rules of the road. Uh, I've got a link in the resources to the Bike Sense BC Guide, which is a very good read and uh, you know lays out all of the basics of uh, bicycle safety and good practice. And of course, you have to use uh, safety equipment. Uh, a helmet I mentioned before. Uh, many e-bikes also come with lights that are wired up to the e-bike battery, so you could basically use them all the time without having to worry about recharging them. Uh, Heidi, can you talk to about the uh, other e-bike differences and uh, things that people see when they're riding them? Yeah, um, like you said, uh, e-bikes go faster, so you will notice there are some extra safety precautions. Like usually, you won't see uh, an e-bike with rim brakes; it'll have a stronger braking system. Um, and for for a lot of people, if you're just coming from your standard kind of beat up hybrid, uh, that's going to be an adjustment system. The brakes are a little bit more touchy because you are putting more weight behind it. So kind of getting the feel of one having a little bit more weight on the bike to having that power so when you are at a dead stop and you're getting started again there's going to be some assist if you've got your power turned on so just the little uh new things with the bike are really important to learn especially if you haven't ridden in a while and you're a little bit nervous about it making sure you're testing out the bike in a quieter area just so you can get a feel of it is really important yeah, and, and definitely my own experience is, is even for me as an experienced cyclist it was definitely very helpful to um uh, get used to the bike on residential streets or uh, parking lots and that sort of thing. And then you can kind of work your way up. Our AAA bike lanes are a great resource for this. Uh, the multi-use bike paths such as the um, Galloping Goose and the ENN. And then you can work your confidence up to the painted bike lanes or to uh, streets without painted lanes on them. Uh, some of the uh, skills uh, items I saw mentioned so the thing that we normally teach are for people to be uh, conscious of maneuverability. So am I at a place on the road where I can easily avoid um, uh, easily avoid obstacles? Uh, visibility. So uh, do I have uh, clothing and lights on my bike to make the bike easy to see? And uh, since there is no penalty for keeping your lights on all the time, we really encourage people to do that all hours of the, all hours of day and night. Uh, predictability, so you need to learn how to ride in a way where motorists can figure out what you're going to do next and they don't have to guess and uh, the bike sense uh, has a, a manual does have some good advice on that.
but certainly encourage people also to take education if that's a, a possibility for you. And then again, communicating with vehicles. So uh, using hand signals and making sure that your intentions are kind of clearly indicated. Uh, Bike Victoria does offer e-bike and bicycle safety courses. Uh, what we're planning to do as the um, uh, restrictions around the pandemic are relaxed is to start delivering those with a combination of online lectures and then outdoors uh, by skill sections and uh, test rides uh, through various kinds of areas to get people used to them. And so uh, stay tuned for the details of that and uh, feel free to reach out to Justine as, uh, if you're interested in uh, having a course like that. So comments in Q&A. So uh, Justine, do we have any questions? We do have questions. Um, I'm back. Um, so yeah, folks, you can keep writing them in. I have three here right now, but we have lots of time. So thank you again, Heidi and Todd. That was a really, really great and informative presentation. Um, I learned a lot about e-bikes. So I'm glad that we've had that. Um, put together now. Uh, so our first question is from Rebecca. And she said, um, I'm interested in an e-bike as a car replacement for a family uh, with one child five years old. Uh, also, I'm wondering about the considerations for buying an e-bike um, used versus new. That's uh, Heidi, go for it. <laughs> yeah, that's an interesting one. Um, I prefer going the new route just because the warranty stays with the original owner, which I think is really important for e-bikes. Um, there's a warranty on the battery, on the motor, uh, with your bike shop, that sort of thing. Um, the other thing too is uh, it would be challenging to ensure that um, the bike is kind of true to advertisement, if that makes sense. So making sure that the motor, say, doesn't have 2,000 kilometers on it and the battery um, has been kept outside and, and it's not in, it's really hard to tell. The bike could look amazing, but if they've kept the motor and the battery in kind of a damp area, that sort of thing, it could present well, but in actual fact, pose problems later. So just to ensure that you're actually getting the quality bike with all of the the warranties and that sort of thing, I prefer the new route, just, just for peace of mind. Excellent, and uh, the photo that I have on the slide actually is an example of a small cargo bike that might be usable for uh, uh, somebody with uh, one child. So uh, you can mount a uh, either a uh, bike seat or a little rack that uh, a child could sit on on the back of this particular kind of e-bike. and. So this is an example of something that might be very usable or is frequently used as a, uh, uh, as a potential uh, cargo bike or car replacement. Uh, the biggest thing that probably would wear out on an e-bike is the battery itself. And uh, Heidi, how much does a battery typically cost? It really depends on what kind of motor system you have, again, with, with that chart that we had. I would say usually... Um, you're looking in the three to $500 price point for a new battery. Now, that being said, like even in the last five years, they've nearly cut in half uh, in terms of the price of their batteries. So it is coming down and, and becoming a lot more cost effective, but they are an expensive replacement. For sure, thanks. Okay, so uh, Justine, uh, next question. All right, this one is from Anne and she says, I'm in the process of ordering a Virtue um, school bus, uh, 250W, and this will be my first e-trike. And I'm excited to learn more about how to keep uh, how to keep our ice cream wagon in top function. So, um, are there any uh, any suggestions for this kind of e-trike? So Heidi, how would you maintain an e-bike or an e-trike? Yeah, um, so making sure, just like with any traditional bike, the more use it gets, um, making sure you're keeping up with your maintenance. So um, just safety-wise and everything like that, you're making sure your parts aren't wearing out. Um, and then also, like I talked about with the bug fixes, just making sure you're up to date on those. Um, as well as, I find trikes do function a little bit differently than a traditional bicycle. So if you're really used to riding just a standard two-wheel traditional tricycle, making sure that before you put a bunch of weight on the tricycle, you just get uh, the feeling of it and, and how it functions differently than a normal bike. 
Well, that's excellent. And just for general maintenance, most e-bikes uh, do put a little bit more stress on the chain because of the e-assist. So you do have to keep a bit of an eye on a chain stretch mm -hmm. and also because you're stopping something that's a bit heavier and something like, uh, you know, an, an ice cream uh, a wagon or something like that. Uh, does have more weight to it, so I would definitely keep an eye on my brake pads and make sure that I change them frequently enough. I love that idea, though, an ice cream wagon. That's awesome. <laughs> and we're seeing all kinds of things. Around uh, Sydney, for example, uh, they do have a, uh, a program called Cycling Without Age, and so they have uh, bicycles that carry two full-size adult passengers that are e-assisted, okay. and so they give... Uh, uh, bike rides to uh, seniors who couldn't uh, necessarily uh, pedal themselves using these uh, e-bikes and so the range of things people are doing is truly amazing awesome. so yeah. and uh, Justine do we have other questions mm -hmm. this one is from Matthew and he says what are your opinions on the qualities of the different brands of mid-drive motors uh, example Bosch Bosch versus Shimano versus Bafung retrofit kits, etc. Um, also looking for assistance delivery and uh, torque versus cadence sensing, smoothness of engagement, noise, display controls, walk assist modes. Um, yeah, could you speak to different brands at all, Heidi? Yeah, totally. Um, so one of the biggest things that I look at um, for e-bikes with the different brands is just uh, the ease of access to them. So um, I find with some of the, the brands that have used kind of their own companies to make um, e-assist on their bikes, it's completely specialized to their brand. So uh, if you wanna get warranty parts or uh, services or that sort of thing, you can only work through their company. And if you don't, if you move to somewhere where you don't have that dealer in your town or something like that, it makes it a lot more challenging for servicing your bike. So that's why ones like Bosch, Shimano, those sorts of ones, um, are super accessible. Every bike shop essentially can service Shimano. Bosch is one of the biggest names in terms of, of companies. And so you'll be able to get replacement parts super easily for anything to do with that. And everything's very regu regulated there because it is a bike company. So one of the biggest things I would look at is just how specialized are the parts and the components on the bike? And will you be able to have easy access to those should something happen? That's kind of the biggest thing for me. Um, in terms of the torque and the cadence and every noise, um, that's very specific to the person. Uh, some people like mountain bikers, for instance, want a lot of torque on their bikes because they want to be able to get going quickly, especially on a rocky, hairy spot. Someone that's carrying four kids in their bike when they come to a stop sign might not want as much torque because that'll be a bit of a jolt to get going. Mm -hmm. um, so that's really specific to the kind of riding that you're doing. Noise. I've ridden a bunch of different models with e-bikes, and to be honest, I haven't personally noticed noise much as a factor. That being said, um, I think you're going to find with kind of your budget e-bikes, they're going to be a little bit noisier. Um, you're not going to have quite as much quality with your display screens and your options. Um, I think that's kind of all I can speak to in terms of the noise component. With your display screens, your options, your walk assist, um, every company kind of has something a little bit different. So Bosch, you're going to have four different levels of assist. Shimano, you're going to have three. But in terms of your price range with e-bikes, you'll find most, most bikes have the same bottom level of assist and top level of assist in your price range. The differences are going to be how many notches you have, how many options you have in between that. Yeah, that's great. And I guess like anything else, to some extent, you get what you pay for. <laughs> There's yeah. probably uh, four big suppliers of uh, e-bike motors. You mentioned Bosch, and my understanding is that they have more than 50% market share, so they're definitely the most common kind. Uh, there's also uh, Broza. Uh, my e-bike has a Yamaha motor. Uh, Shimano, you mentioned, is kind of an up-and-comer. And so yeah. there's a number of uh, major companies, and if you kind of stick to those, your availability of parts in the future is probably going to be better. Uh, yeah. The question also mentioned things like retrofit kits and things of that nature. 
Uh, those are kind of much more common three to five years ago when e-bikes were sort of in their infancy. And uh, I think in this day and age, uh, if it were me, I might be inclined to stay away from things like that because they'll be a lot yeah. harder to support in the future. Yeah, especially just the one note on the kit is really making sure you bring your bike to a mechanic prior to that to ensure that you've got all the safeguards on the bike to make sure you can put an electric assist. So one of the things that we spoke about earlier was the braking system and that most e-bikes will have a stronger braking system um, than a, a standard V-brake. So if you've got your commuter and you wanna put a bike kit on it, uh, that's not a good idea because um, you, you need to make sure that the brakes are compatible with electric assist and that sort of thing. Super, um, Justine, more questions? Okay, um, another question from Rebecca. She says, my child is five. What's better, a large cargo that I can carry her and a friend and groceries, or the ones where they can straddle on the back? Oh. Uh, well, that's, that's a great question. I'll just sort of flip back to the uh, picture that we had there. Uh, so the ones that we're showing in these pictures are um, uh, cargo uh, bikes where you have kind of a box on the front. And in terms of sort of flexibility or the amount of you know people and cargo you can carry, I think these are probably the uh, probably the most flexible option. And the picture on the far left, if I expanded the whole picture, uh, the woman actually has a total of seven kids with her. <laughs> so I think she has four in the yeah. box, uh, one on the back, and then a couple on trailer bikes. So that's kind of the extreme case. And um, you know, and again, a lot of it really just depends on how many kids and how much cargo you foresee yourself carrying. Mm -hmm. uh, but with the longer tail cargo bikes, you can also probably fit up to two kids uh, behind the rider. Uh, but it would be hard to do that and have groceries with you and that sort of thing. Uh, Heidi, what are your thoughts? I've seen as many as three kids on the back of the bike. That being said, um, if you want to get five or seven like this lady's got on here, which is incredible, um, having that box on the front, then um, it just is a little bit more stable because the box has a wider base. So kind of lower center of gravity, just your balance is going to be a little bit better with that box on the front having. So that's if you want to get five or six kids on uh, up to three on the back is totally fine. You will um, have like bars and that sort of thing to make sure they're, they're stable on there. But that being said, if you want to do the groceries and everything like that, it is a lot harder to get the panniers on the back of the bike along with the kids because their legs come out and that sort of thing. So that box in the front is really functional, I find. Yeah, and I guess just like anything else, maybe the best option for people is to get a demo and try them out because cargo bikes are big investment. And uh, that way you can figure out what's best for you. Mm. Um, actually, that was my question, Heidi. The The demo uh, program is still going on during the pandemic right now? We actually just started it up this week, which is awesome. Um, yeah, and the one thing I was going to say with it, the perspective parents with the cargo bikes, that's kind of the one biggest thing I find is the parents are a little bit nervous about putting their kids in the cargo bikes. And then it is a big investment for the cargo bikes. So they want to make sure that they're totally able to do it before it happens. And we do have cargo bikes like those pictured in our demo fleet, the ones with the basket on the front and everything like that. So you can pop your kids in there, take it out for a ride, kind of get the feel of it, which I think is really important. Um, but yeah, we've upped our safety measures and everything like that. All the bikes come completely sanitized but we just this week started to be able to do our demo on demand program again. Oh, that's fabulous. Exciting. Excellent. Um, here is a question from, oh, from Lana. Um, Lana is one of our uh, cycling instructors at Bike to Work as well. And she's asking, um, Heidi, can you comment on carrying passengers and um, motor vehicle act law? Specifically, is carrying capacity specified with each bike or just squish as many little kids that can fit in one seat? No, so carrying capacity is totally specified with the bike, um, as well as with some of them like age and that sort of thing. So there are um, restrictions in place to make sure it's safe with the um, front cargo ones with the baskets it's a little bit more malleable because there's some that you can put even car seats in um with the rear ones though it's really important that uh the kid is 
uh, old enough that they can sit up by themselves, like obviously got to be able to hold their head up, that sort of thing. And there are weight restrictions, amount of kids restrictions. So every bike is specific in that and uh, online, or you can ask your local retailer about the specific models you're looking at and the restrictions for how many kids or the weight of the kids or the age of the kids, that sort of thing. Perfect. And the other comment I'll make is regardless of the age of the kid, everybody has to wear a helmet. Yes. <laughs> and that's yes. true of a, any kind of, uh, any kind of a, a carrier for kids on your bike or even things like a trailer, yeah. everybody needs to wear a helmet. So. Yeah. Well, thank you. Excellent. Um, this question is from Max and he said, um, what was the registration options? Uh, project 529, what is that? Uh, sure, so Project 529 is a uh, uh, kind of a company or, or an organization, I guess, that was started by uh, uh, someone in Seattle that had their bicycle stolen. Uh, they started up this service and it's used by a number of police departments to register and recover stolen bikes. Uh, the Vancouver Police Department is a uh, sort of the flagship for that. And on the island here, it's been used by the Nanaimo RCMP. Uh, you basically just go to their website, project529.com, and uh, you can register your bike or you can download an app on the uh, uh, Apple or Android app stores, and it allows you to uh, create a registration for your bike. Uh, you can take photos of your bike, you with your bike, the sales receipt, <laughs> anything else that's really pertinent, as well as entering serial numbers and things of that nature. And then if the bike is ever uh, stolen, uh, then it makes it easier for law enforcement to go and look up that bike and determine if, in fact, uh, it's been reported stolen and where. And it has a bit of an advantage over the Vic PD registry in the sense that even if your bike is, uh, for example, stolen in Victoria but turns up in Vancouver, uh, then they can still find you and recover it. And uh, about 27% of stolen bikes in Victoria uh, are returned and uh, easy, uh, the easier you can make it for police to find you, the more likely it is to get back to you. Uh, thanks, Todd. Uh, we have another question from Anne, and she said, uh, what are the options for puncture-proof tires? And I guess this is for Heidi, but maybe just like Oak Bay bikes in general. Yeah. Um there are a bunch of different options. There's some that are Kevlar lined. I find with all e-bikes, you're going to find that they've got um, a better reinforced tire on there just because they do see um, a lot of use. But something um, that's puncture resistant, puncture proof, like a lot of tires when you buy them will say puncture resistant, puncture proof on them. No tire is completely 100% immune to getting punctures. But that being said, there are some really option, awesome options that are Kevlar lined or um, similarly. Yeah, and that's a great point. With e-bikes, weight isn't really an issue. So it's uh, after years of riding a road bike, you know, you're trying to uh, eliminate every gram. The mindset's very different going to an e-bike and you could afford to have very, uh, you know, very tough, very durable tires and uh, hopefully make it a lot less likely that you'll get a puncture. Mm -hmm. um, we have a question from Catherine, and she says, I see a lot of bikes with 250W motors, and then I see a few with 500Ws, um, since I have a lot of uphills for the commute home. Would a 250 be sufficient, or would you recommend a 500W motor as a better choice? Um, currently using an unassisted commuter bike that's only 30 pounds versus the weight of an e-bike. Yeah, totally. Um, again, that's really personal preference. Um, the biggest thing that you'll find with the 500 watt motors is they've got a, a higher torque. So that means from your stop to your start and how quickly they can get up to those speeds, those are kind of the biggest things. Um, the assist to your pedals is going to be similar. You are going to find there's a bit more zip to that 500. Um, if you do have a lot of hills in your commute and your commute's um, a decent amount, I would recommend the 500. That not being said, you can't do it with the 250. It's totally feasible, totally doable. Um, you'll just feel a little bit more zip to that 500 watt motor. 
And that's a great answer. And in BC, the limit for uh, e-bikes that can be ridden on the road and trails and things like that at this point is 500 watts. Uh, things that are kind of above 500 watts are, you know, for off-road use only. Uh, but the best advice I think I could give somebody would be to try it out. <laughs> so go and uh, take the bike, try and ride it where you would actually ride it. You know, if you live, uh, have to ride over hills and things like that, try riding over hills. If you're, you know, going to carry stuff with you, then try carrying stuff with you. And then, you know, you can decide which one is actually best for you because uh, sometimes the only way to really answer that for sure is to try it. Yeah. Um, so you folks did address this a bit earlier, but Adam is asking, what do you guys think about retrofitting my current bike uh, and getting a motor added to it? Do you think that's a good idea? really case specific um a few things to look at like are your brakes strong enough to accommodate putting an electric assist on it are the components durable enough um do they have enough life left in them to be able to put an electric assist kit on it frame integrity all of those sorts of things are big factors when you're looking at putting an electric assist kit on it um I personally prefer going for the bikes that are already electric assist just because then you know that the components are electric assist grade, um, the, the brakes, that sort of thing are going to be able to hold up and that everything is compatible. Uh, whereas with like you've got wires and that sort of thing and making sure that you're able to get those routed around your bike properly. There's a lot of things that do go in it. So my biggest thing would be take it to a registered mechanic, someone that that works in a good shop and have them look over your bike because they'll be able to tell you if your bike can actually accommodate a kit on it. Well, that's great, thank you. Uh, looks like we have one more comment. Um, this is Lana talking about um, the noise uh, factor. And she says, my friend has a high quality Norco VLT, great bike, but one very irritating feature uh, for, to me, uh, which is that the bike, when the bike is coasting, it makes a rapid ticking noise. I have ridden other Norco VLTs and didn't notice the same noise. Um, yes, yeah, so that's actually um, kind of a person specific thing. So, um, and this is even with traditional bikes as well. So that's not actually anything to do with the motor or the electric assist. It's actually in your hub. Um, and so different greases, different hubs, different wheel builds all change that taking. Like if you see high performance road bikers, that tick is kind of um, a status thing. Like the nicer bikes, kind of the louder ticks frequently mm -hmm. have. Um, so with that, it's just genuinely a matter of potentially changing out what lubricant that wheel was built with that hub has in it um, or the wheel build. So that isn't something that you have to stress about when you're buying an e-bike, it's totally changeable. Well, that's great. And you know, another advantage of uh, buying from a local bike shop. Exactly. Um, so those are all the questions we've got. Um, do you folks have any final comments? Sure, Heidi, I'll let you go first. I No, I don't think I am. I mean, I think just the biggest takeaway is uh, if you're kind of thinking about an e-bike, um, even if you're not, just try one out. They're super cool. Then at least you know what all the fuss is about. It's super easy to pop into a bike shop and just take one for a spin. And genuinely, it's so worth it. It's the fuss is real. Like I love, love the e-bikes um, and just the options that they give. Well, excellent. And uh, I'll just mention some resources here. So um, uh, the Victoria Bike to Work Society is part of this uh, series of webinars has put together a resource library. And uh, so this uh, presentation, the recording of it will be in the uh, library in the next day or two. Uh, there's also a one pager from ICBC sort of uh, with a little bit more description of what constitutes an e-bike. Uh, Oak Bay Bikes has a great website. Here's a URL to go directly to their e-bike section, which uh, has a lot of great information on it. Uh, YouTube has a multitude of channels that uh, talk about e-bikes. Uh, one of the most useful ones is uh, something called Electric Bike Review, and I've just included a little uh, screen capture here. Uh, but that's a site that was started by a fellow from Vancouver named Court Rye and he's recorded hundreds of videos 
<laughs> about different types of bikes and reviewing them and things like that. So definitely encourage people to give that a look. And then also here are our email addresses and feel free to send us an email if you do have uh, follow on questions. Now a little infomercial. So the next webinar is gonna be on uh, cycling comfort and uh, how to make sure that you can uh, ride your bike comfortably and efficiently and talk about things like uh, bike fitting. So I uh, certainly encourage people to uh, take advantage of that. Uh, I've had a, a professional bike fitting and I got to say it made an enormous difference in my comfort riding and uh, encourage people to uh, take advantage of that. Yeah, thank you, Todd. Um, that's a great segue. Um, yeah, we hope to see folks at our next webinar. And that's going to be uh, Wednesday at 11, uh, June 10th. Um, and I, yeah, again, I'd really like to thank our speakers today, um, Heidi and Todd. This has been great. Uh, and I think we are ready to end the webinar. Um, so folks, when this is over, there's a quick survey again. Um, feel free to take it. It really helps us uh, make these webinars as uh, good as possible. Thank you everyone for attending. Um, and yeah, ride safely out there. Hope to see everyone in e-bikes. Thank you. Thank you.